Hi everyone, I'm Gina Chan. I'm a columnist for Reuters Breaking Views. Thank you for joining us. I hope all of you and your families are staying healthy at this difficult time. Um, I'm really looking forward to our chat today about stock market volatility during and post COVID-19. Um, I was just thinking about in preparing for this, uh, the last time I traveled, which was back in January, that now seems like a lifetime ago, I was at the uh, World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. And at that time, um, actually, even with cases rising in China, there wasn't that much talk about uh, COVID-19. Um, it seemed like the leaders of the world and the business community thought this was something that would be largely contained in China. And uh, there wasn't much discussion about it, really. And unfortunately, we saw that was not the case. And as the virus spread and we saw many governments institute lockdowns that caused businesses to shut down, force people to stay at home. We saw global markets react in kind. But then the central banks and governments of the world also stepped in. We saw some of the measures used in the last financial crisis in 2008 come back again with central banks uh, dramatically lowering interest rates, dramatically boosting asset purchases, we saw governments kick in with their fiscal response, whether it was uh, in the UK trying to supplement or replace some of the lost wages and income up to a certain amount. In the United States, we saw stimulus checks and additional unemployment assistance. So we want to talk about how all of that, along with the health response, affected markets and where we go from here. Uh, we've seen markets um, in the United States and, and elsewhere recover. Uh, in some ways, some of the markets like the NASDAQ seem maybe even disconnected from the real economy. It's up, I just saw today, year to date, up about 30%, uh, which is amazing considering uh, sort of elevated um, unemployment rates and uh, still a lot of pain going on um, in various societies. And we're also seeing uh, some form of restrictions return because the virus, unfortunately, has not gone away. And a lot of countries are experiencing uh, new waves of infections. And that's also affecting markets. We also have um, other things going on in the world besides COVID-19. We have Brexit discussions continuing. We have the U.S. presidential elections here. God help us <laughs> that we will provide that. Um, and there's other things besides the pandemic that could also affect market volatility. So we have uh, a distinguished panel of guests to discuss all of these issues. I will uh, introduce each of them and they'll each have uh, two minutes to give opening remarks and then we'll start our discussion. So first, let me just introduce them. And um, since we don't have the benefit of all being in person, if you don't mind just uh, waving a bit when I say your name so they know who you, who you are. Um, first, we have David Drake, uh, founder and chairman of LDJ Capital here in the United States. David, welcome. Thank and uh, next, we have Colin Hunt, chief executive officer of Allied Irish Banks in Ireland. Here's Colin. And we have Dan Kern, Chief Investment Officer of TFC Financial Management, also here in the States. And we might have, if uh, hopefully the uh, technical issues can get worked out, we also have William Hobbs, uh, Chief Investment Officer at Barclays Investment Solutions. So we, he may be joining us later. But Colin, if I could go to you first for two minutes of opening remarks. Thanks so much indeed, uh, Gina, and thanks very much to harass us for the opportunity to speak with you all virtually uh, uh, this afternoon or this morning. Um, it would be great if we were in Lisbon, uh, enjoying all that that wonderful city has to present, but unfortunately events have conspired to force us into this new way of communicating. And um, I, I, there's, there's a, a word, the world is full of people who overuse words. And one of the words is overused is unprecedented, but it actually is exactly what is appropriate in the context that we're currently dealing with. This is a truly unprecedented uh, crisis. 
uh, in terms of its scale, its severity, its global nature, uh, and also its impact on health, uh, on society, and on economies. And that unprecedented uh, crisis has provoked an unprecedented response on the part of policymakers and institutions right the way around uh, the world. And to a large extent, the traditional economic policy rule books and guides have been shredded uh, over the course of the last six months uh, or so. Uh, we're seeing extraordinary fiscal stimulus globally. Uh, we're seeing extraordinary monetary policy stimulus uh, globally. Uh, we're seeing the relaxation of banking regulation. Uh, to ensure that capital buffers don't get in the way of allowing banks uh, to support the stabilization of economies and indeed uh, their future recovery. And uh, I think that what we've seen, the, this, co this combined action uh, has actually served to significantly limit market volatility. We did see some dislocation at the very start of the crisis, but really, it has been phenomenal in terms of the lack of volatility, given the scale of the uncertainty that is presenting itself in terms not only of the path of the virus, but also the path of economic activity over the near uh, to medium term. So policy is doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's significantly reducing volatility. It's protecting economies. And it is doing its utmost to keep the system intact uh, as we search for a vaccine, which will be the only way of bringing this crisis to a full stop. What I'm really interested in is what are the long-term long consequences? Uh, what does this do for the future shape of policy? What does it do for the shape, future shape of the economies that we all live in? Uh, and I look forward to exploring that with you over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. Great. Thank you, Colin. David? Thank you, Gina and Arasis, for having me on board here, calling from the U.S. Uh, originally, I was born and raised in Stockholm, Sweden. Unfortunately, I managed to come to scholarships and study and make my wealth here in the U.S. 30 years ago. Um, I feel that I agree with Colin that the volatility has been a lot less than we thought on a uh, macro perspective. But on a micro perspective, we're seeing you know, certain alternative investments taking a bigger volatility movement again the stock market just with small moves expectations. Um, as a family office, you know, we've been looking more at, you know, offsetting this volatility uh, regardless of COVID by focusing on short selling hedge funds and alternative financing that's not uh, exposed to volatility. And I'm specifically uh, referencing, we'll talk later about, about alternative financing like car loans to uh, real estate and single family homes that actually sales are peaking in the U.S., which is a little surprise to me. And we're seeing less and less people moving out of their homes. So there's a, very, there's a shortage of uh, new construction and family homes being sold in the world, which was interesting. And on the first part, we were exposed in crypto and the uh, Initially, crypto years ago was not exposed to stock market, but when people panic, then people panic you know, across all markets. So we've seen crypto following the Dow very closely recently, which is fortunate and unfortunate. And I'm looking forward to sharing more information about this and talking to our dear colleagues on this call. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jay. And then Dan. Well, thank you to Horasis and to Frank Jurgen Richter for including me in this in this great panel. The subject of market volatility is really is is really interesting, and I'm excited about about pursuing it with the, my fellow panelists. I feel like markets reacted pretty predictably to the massive uncertainty created by the pandemic. We really started out in a state of denial in the early stages of COVID case counts rising. And then, and then transitioned pretty rapidly to despair as it became clear that the that the COVID wasn't going to go away on its on its own. Um, and markets re reacted, I think, in a in a very uh, rational in a rational irrational manner in, in in response to elevated uncertainty. Then we had really forceful central bank response and fiscal response that followed shortly thereafter. 
And that really provided hope to the world that the liquidity crisis caused by a really unique set of circumstances would be less likely to become a solvency crisis at the level of the global financial crisis. And to your point earlier, Gina, it, it seems like there's this seeming disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street that's hard to understand. It's hard to, to understand how the NASDAQ market can be up so much while we still have millions of people unemployed in the U.S. and, and a, a multiple of that around the world. But I think there's some, some very reasonable explanations. And in a lot of ways, the markets responded in a rational way to what's going on going on in the world. The last thing that I, that I want to mention is before we segue into questions and, and answers is that from a policy perspective, I, I worry about two things. You know, one is that this crisis isn't over, but yet I see some degree of policy fatigue in the U.S. Um, and in Europe. The, the recovery fund in the EU may be, may be delayed. We have jousting uh, about whether we'll get a, 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 another pandemic relief bill before the U.S. election. I, I worry about, about policy fatigue because we, we haven't gotten to the other side of this yet. The other thing that I worry about, and, and, and I'll echo points made earlier in the day by other, by other speakers, America first policies and country first, whether you're in the US, in China, or anywhere else in the world, these very nationalistic policy approaches, I think have the potential to really backfire in a world in which we have major challenges that cross geographic borders. And the pandemic certainly is top of mind, but I think about climate change as well. These, the solutions to these problems require collective effort, and collective effort more like what we saw during the global financial crisis. And I'm hoping that we can get back to that spirit of collective effort as we move forward. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, so I wanted to start off, and if all of you could answer this question, because I'm really curious as to your views on it, um, how you would rate central banks and governments, and obviously we can't rate all of them, we can just look at some of the major ones, uh, in their response. Um, you know, Dan, to your point about that this isn't over, there is some sense that um, central banks have really kicked in with a lot of ammunition from the get-go. I mean, seeing how quickly the Fed acted this time around versus the 08 crisis was was pretty um, amazing to see. But has that almost replaced or, or given a sense of almost a false cushion for governments in terms of their uh, fiscal response? Have they done enough um, to kick in themselves with, with stimulus and, and um, trying to supplement household income. Uh, Colin, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, I, I think that the pace of the response, which is truly remarkable, was demanded by the pace of the crisis. Normally you see a, an economic calamity like this coming at you for a matter of months, and the labor market response normally takes a matter of months. But because of the scale of the crisis and the way in which governments responded uh, in attempt to to uh, to underpin to, to to secure the health of the countries, uh, the way the governments responded with lockdown restrictions, we had an immediate unemployment uh, uh, response. And I think it was that scale of that collapse in the labour market and the speed of it that was very provocative of the sort of monetary policy responses we've seen and indeed uh, the fiscal uh, response as well. Um, I think that uh, not only are we getting the resumption of, of QE, not only are we getting the zero basing of policy rates, uh, but uh, the Fed, the ECB and now the Bank of England sort of revising their policy outlooks, revising their policy frameworks and making it abundantly clear I think that uh, the exceptional times we're seeing will continue to have an exceptional policy response for so long as it is needed. Now, on the fiscal side, we've had a variable response uh, across countries. In Europe, we've had national response, 
uh, very, very significant national responses from countries with a very, very long and proud tradition of uh, fiscal probity, such as Germany. Uh, but we've also had a super uh, national response uh, through the EU's uh, pandemic response as well. So I, I, I think that we couldn't really ask for more, certainly in Europe, in terms of what we're seeing, uh, in terms of monetary spigots being turned on, and also the budgetary spigots in terms uh, of, of, of public expenditure uh, in particular. It's been extraordinarily supportive, but it can't go on forever. Uh, there is a limit to it. Uh, we're probably some way away from the limit, and uh, I, I, we, we won't begin to explore the consequences of tightening these policies until such time that the COVID virus is contained. And that's probably well into the middle of next year. But uh, there will be very interesting consequences, I think, uh, when the policy supports begin to be removed. Yeah. And David, if I could turn to you, um, how would you rate the response? And um, particularly, as Colin uh, mentioned earlier, and you also mentioned that it, it stemmed the the volatility that could have occurred uh, given the scale of this crisis, but perhaps um, caused some consternation in other areas. Well, thank you for asking me. Uh, and Gina and Colin, you know, I agree with you that the reaction by governments and policies is much faster. It goes back to the IC imposing the eight biggest banks in the U.S. that they have to report back to FDIC how they would handle a Great Depression again. And that was an assault from the Great Depression 2009 forward. And today they'll be able to implement reaction uh, solutions to it. Granted, the capital loss to the Great Depression is nothing we've seen now. Now it's, you know, employment mainly and certain businesses taking a big hard hit, small businesses getting a hard hit. And I, I, I find the the mortgage forbearance we did in the U.S. where you can lay your home's uh, mortgage for a year or more being implemented allows less uh, stress in the family if they lost their job and they cannot pay for their home. And I think that made a huge difference in the U.S. because we're also reflected in today's lack of inventory in new construction and housing in the U.S., which is interesting. And on the macro, on the micro side of things, housing in Long Island, you know, Westchester and Jersey has gone up as much as 50% because everybody in the city moved out. On the flip side, um, New York has billions uh, lost in revenue from people leaving the city and consequently are facing like like in the 1980s, you know, where, you know, de Blasio removed the financing for the police department for homeless. And now there's homeless all over the city and there's no solution in there. And 45% of the retail stores in New York are empty. That will take at least five years to be absorbed and filled again. And they will be filled by more service-oriented companies. They will be, you know, uh, you know, handled by companies who are more focused on services to clients and customers coming there. But from the macro perspective, the government uh, had moved quickly, as I agree with Colin, and surprisingly created a stimulus and quantitative easing uh, that we did not foresee would be as effective as it is today. If you just walk around different neighborhoods, there are a lot less properties for sale. Than it was before, and that is quite a strong leverage on the efficiency. And Dan, so so from a central bank um, perspective, I would give Jay Powell and the Fed very high marks for their response, and I think that Powell really learned from from two two preceding events. Um, certainly, he had the global financial crisis playbook from the Bernanke Fed that he really took and he expanded creatively. I've seen Bernanke praise um, Powell and the Fed for their creativity. Um, and I think I think that was an important learning experience for, for Powell and the other members of the Fed. But I also think that Mario Draghi um, and his work with the ECB during the, the sovereign debt crisis, where Draghi had his whatever it takes speech. I think in many ways, uh, Powell was channeling Draghi during the early, the, the early stages of the pandemic and coming 
and being very vocal, coming to the market with, you know, a, a, a massive intervention um, and a very creative and decisive intervention. And in many ways, the Fed has had an impact beyond the money that they put in the market because Powell has communicated that the Fed will do whatever, whatever it takes. Unfortunately, there's limitations to what the Fed, the Bank of Japan, the ECB um, can, can do. Um, one of the points that, that I've seen made is that the, the, the Fed can loan money and can help um, facilitate capital markets activity, but the Fed's not in the business of granting money, of giving money to households that, that need help with their bills to small businesses that are going bankrupt at a at a very frightening at a very frightening rate, there needs to be fiscal stimulus uh, on the other on the other side of this. The other thing that I worry about, uh, to Colin's earlier point, is when we get to the other side of this, what aspects of what's supposed to be temporary pandemic relief become more permanent? I worry about the law of unintended consequences. And I, I think I, there's a lot to worry about in terms of zombie companies. We, we don't want the U.S., the U.K., or Europe to be like Japan, where there are uh, companies or industries that are in terminal decline that are rescued by continued government, government support. Uh, I can understand some bridge support for airlines, uh, but I think if that support lasts too long, there's a, a concern that airlines will become a ward of the state. Retail malls and retailers, the same kind of thing. They were under pressure before the pandemic, and certainly there's business interruption that will go away. But I wouldn't want to see uh, a large number of retailers become effectively wards of the state. Yeah. No, well, I, I definitely want to get into the long-term consequences in a bit really important points, as you noted. Uh, but first, I wanted to also get to um, the public health response by governments, uh, because unlike in 08, it has such a multifaceted crisis, beginning with uh, containing the virus itself. And we uh, governments in, institute various measures. Um, David, I'd love to talk to you about Sweden and, and what they did or didn't do, I, I should say, and how that affected uh, the economy, but how do you see that affecting uh, markets? Because there's some sort of you know, short-term responses to news about you know, progress on a vaccine or, or uh, you know, the latest uh, unemployment figures and that sort of thing, but are markets really responding as, as much anymore to sort of the, the, uh, health of the society and how well this is being contained. Um, Colin, you were saying earlier that, you know, you're going back to some restrictions because infections are on the rise. We're seeing the UK uh, also go through that. Um, how, how are markets digesting this as it, it's such a fluid situation? So um, if you allow me to go first, you know, uh, as I said, my parents live in Stockholm and I was born and raised in Sweden, but, you know, came to the U.S. 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, I've been monitoring how many uh, people have passed away from COVID based on one million population. And uh, about a month and a half ago, Sweden was uh, number six in the world with the highest uh, amount of people dead uh, in, per, uh, in percentage. Granted, Sweden is a small country. I would say Brooklyn is bigger than Sweden in population. We have 9 million people, and it's almost the same size as Brooklyn. Yet again, the herd mentality has been uh, uh, embraced in Sweden. And granted, we had the sixth highest amount of people dead per million population. And a month and a half later, today, Sweden's number 14. You got, you know... Nine other, uh, eight other countries surpassing Sweden in the uh, mortality rate from COVID, and obviously uh, in the beginning, Sweden was you know uh, regarded as an outliner and was doing you know not shutting anything down. As the argument was, well, we have very good communication with between the government and the people. Granted, it's also a very large country where people are more dispersed, so. 
I think uh, coming back to your question, how markets are looking at it back in the U.S., uh, I see you know the market being you know one percent, two percent, well half a percent to one percent volatility in the Dow, just on expectation if there will be a cure or a stimulus package by the government for unemployment. And I've seen that you know every, day by day fluctuate and uh, change. Uh, well, make it more volatile. Granted, it's not a huge volatility. It's a uh, compressed volatility, as Colin mentioned before, and we've seen governments react relatively good to it. The argument is, could you do it better? So uh, the answer it is yes. I think it is affecting the markets on how the governments are handling COVID. And the resurgence is, you know, uh, making giving people less confidence in the markets you also remember you know everybody's stuck at home a certain industry get more things done that way like the film business i've talked to friends in the film business and they're like oh this is great everybody i call is home and available <laughs> they're not traveling they're not lunch they're not driving i get more product done now than ever before in my life <laughs> and you know um that's one positive thing, you know, of many negative things during this portion. But I feel that um, the government can do more, and obviously the volatility will be more affected that in the U.S. because of the election right now. So um, unfortunately, I saw the debate last night, and I didn't have a good feeling about that when I came out of it. So I will not see if there's a better second debate or no debate at all going forward to the election. And, you know, foreign business that we have, uh, even though we have, you know, I have offices in Hong Kong, uh, uh, Seoul, and in Dubai, um, unless business is being done because we need to meet people face-to-face. You know, a lot of private equity is done face to face and it's slowed down tremendously because we do not know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, unfortunately, I feel a little overexposed in the capital markets, but, uh, and on the flip side, I feel that there will be more corrections. Well, and Colin, I'm interested in your thoughts um, with, with you sitting in Ireland um, and especially the, the various. Um, that the countries are facing and, and the UK as well. Um, how are you seeing uh, the public health response and, and possibly this you know, rising infections again and, and new restrictions? Is How are the markets reacting given, you know, we've, we've sort of been through this already and, and I don't know if there's sort of fatigue even just in markets over this. I, I have about immune. Uh, to what's going on with the virus, to be honest with you. Um, here we had a very, very restrictive uh, lockdown at the start, basically shut the entire economy down uh, for a period of weeks, and then we had a gradual relaxation of the restrictions, and as the restrictions were gradually relaxed, we then, having brought the case uh, numbers down to very low single digits, uh, we've now seen a move back up to... 300, 400 cases um, a day as a consequence of the relaxation. But there needs to be a balance struck between uh, protecting the health of the nation and protecting the economy of the nation. And it's very, very difficult for policymakers to strike that balance. In relation to the health response, I actually don't, and I, I very much uh, appreciate what David said, and I think Sweden is an amazing uh, example. But we won't know who took the right approach from a health policy perspective until we've the benefit of looking at this through a rear view mirror. Because as David pointed, Sweden was seen as, as very uh, good at the start, then poor in terms of the case numbers, and then good again. So we, we won't really know who took the most appropriate health response. We've seen a greater divergence in terms of health policy than in any other policy area. We won't know who took the appropriate response until we're beyond the crisis, until we've seen exactly the number of cases, and the amount of mortality in all of the individual uh, societies. I do think, though, that this is... We're not going back to what was normal. We are not going back to the way life was in February or in January, as you were referring to uh, your, 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 your flight to Nava. We are going to see people leaving more of their lives online. There's no question about that. And we see that ourselves in terms of the amount of people using digital banking platforms, our own digital banking platform, rather than traditional 
branch network um, at, at the moment. It is inevitable that people are going to be more agile in terms of how they work. People are going to be working from home more uh, more frequently than they have in the past, and as employers, we're all going to have to accommodate that. The third thing, of course, is, is the sustainability trend. Because there's a view out there that sustainability ha- needs to be sidelined for the moment because of the nature and scale of the COVID crisis. We need to concentrate on that and we can return to the sustainability agenda at some point in the future. I couldn't, I, I fundamentally disagree with that view because the fact that, that this crisis, like nothing else outside war, has exposed the fragility of the societies and the economies in which we live and uh, in in which we operate. From a markets perspective, the scale of the policy response has led to a significant flattening of the yield curve and very low uh, returns in government bonds. And as a consequence, we've seen money flowing into riskier assets. So at a time when we've got a significant degree of uncertainty about the near-term economic path, we're actually seeing uh, 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 capital moving into riskier assets, and that's quite unusual. So we will, obviously, when we get a, when, when we get a vaccine, when we get a proven vaccine and we're seeing it deployed, we are going to see a market bounce. There's no question about it. But I question exactly how long it's going to last when people realise that the, the underpinning of the current trend of the market will inevitably unwound over time, and that's as, as the QE begins to unwind. Yeah. Well, and I wanted to follow up with you on one thing you were saying about, um, and I think Dan mentioned this as well, about the markets being immune to the virus or sort of disconnected um, to the real economy. I mean, what what do you think that also uh, means for the broader economy and, and society? I mean, we saw from the 2008 financial crisis uh, a lot of criticisms about um, what QE did uh to sort of the one percent, or or how much it helped, you know, the one percent versus sort of the average working person, and you're seeing um, some talk about that now. That this is sort of a K recovery, where you know people who are doing well are doing better, and then the people who uh, were sort of in the middle to, to working class are now doing worse. Um, with asset prices being the way they are, are are you worried about a bubble and sort of this talk of uh, how this may um, sort of fuel criticisms about inequality or sort of, you know, populist sentiments? Oh, this to me again. Yes, yes, Colin, sorry. Well, I don't think policymakers uh, have an objective of having uh, a a very, very strong rising asset prices. Uh, That's not the objective. The objective is to stabilize the economic situation, protect the economy, and protect employment. And uh, that is where the focus of attention and focus of energy uh, has been. Markets tend to be significantly forward-looking, and I think they're beginning to anticipate what comes next. Um, but I don't think that policymakers per se are in any way targeting a level of the Dow, um, a level of the of the of the European or the Japanese stock, uh, stock market indices. What they're targeting is protecting the economy and reducing the risk of long-term scarring. But that's something that is very much weighing on their minds. They don't want this crisis to be so extended that it leads to fundamental long-term damage to the economies in which we all operate. Thank you. Thank you. And I wanted to follow up, and I also wanted to, um, in addition to that, Dan, ask you about worries about the long-term consequences. I mean, you mentioned the zombie companies. I mean, there's a fundamental shift in just sort of supply and demand in various sectors that that where there will be a, a reckoning where we can't just keep propping up, you know, with, with grants and loans and, and all this aid at, at some point, you know, you're right, it will have to end and sort of the, the new world order will have to sort of move forward. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Let me see if I can tie the two questions to, together. Um, Inequality and growth in inequality is not unusual in recessions. Um, historic, there's historical evidence that pandemics have 
lead to widening inequality. I think it's really magnified in, in this pandemic because if you think about it, people like the four of us can work from home. And the mandated social distancing has hit lower income people harder than, than people like us who can continue in some ways without missing, missing a beat. Part of the disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street is that if I look at, at the U.S. In, in GDP and employment terms, the parts of the economy hit by social distancing, um, retail, food and beverage, travel, entertainment, that's 19 to 20 percent of GDP and employment. In terms of S&P earnings, it's about 7 percent. So there's a fundamental dis disconnect there. And that's even though the policymakers aren't trying to widen inequality, it's an unfortunate and natural byproduct of, of what's what's happening in the in the world. In terms of long term consequences, it's it, it's easy or relatively easier for policymakers to extend um, help to those that need it temporarily. Um, it's hard to pull that help back. And so I worry about expanded unemployment benefits, um, harming the in incentives to work. I don't think that's a big near-term problem, but I think if, if, if these bonus benefits continue, get reinstated and continue for an extended period of time, that'll affect incentives to work. Um, targeted aid to, to industries, again, that should be temporary, but not, but not permanent. The last point, and then I'll turn the floor over to David, is um, right now, uh, most governments, most developed markets can absorb additional fiscal spending because rates are so low. And I look at all of the money that we're spending in the, in the U.S. Our um, debt servicing as a percentage of, of GDP is considerably lower than it was 20 years ago, despite adding all of this new debt. Eventually, there will be a price to pay because I think eventually longer term rates are going to creep up and the entitlement burden that is inexorably approaching will become big enough that we'll have to make more difficult choices. That's down the road, but it's, it's coming. Yeah. Well, and, and David, if you want to follow up, but I also wanted to ask you, David, um, because we also don't have uh, that much time left. Um, just your thoughts on where we go from here. Um, the UK uh, Central Bank, Bank of England is, is talking about, you know, negative interest rates. The, the Fed just came out and said uh, they foresee basically near zero rates through 2023 uh, and, and sort of adjusted their views on their inflation target. Uh, how do you see that of affecting markets and sort of the lessons learned about, you know, hopefully we won't have another pandemic like this, but um, what are the takeaways that may be useful, you know, if something like this occurs again in the future? No, thanks for asking, Gina. Um, I look back to the great financial crisis, and I don't see the situation now in the area that was then. And... On the institutional side, the sovereign wealth funds and pension funds, they lost a lot of money. The long-term solution, which continues today, was they needed to put money into alternatives to kind of get and catch up on the losses they made in the past. And those alternatives were real estate. And their allocation of real estate for the pension funds and sovereign wealth funds has increased globally throughout the last uh, what is it now, 12 years. And I think this has highlighted the diversification into alternatives and uh, the fear of a bubble on the stock market with the volatility we see. You know, um, you know, in March, uh, Tesla was at 400. Today, Tesla is almost 2100 after the five stock split. You know, that's that's a huge uh, growth for one company, and we've seen other many many other companies who are flourishing in this industry extremely. You know, anything in line tremendously well on the stock market. And I think also we got to remember that a lot of the uh, vacancies in retail we see, like Brooks Brothers, JCPenney, uh, Barney's, they were already 
facing bankruptcy before the crisis. This was the last straw that broke, that broke the back of the camel. And it was just exp uh, expedited uh, their demise, which was coming a long time. So long term, it'll take a long time to absorb it. And I also see that next time we have a situation like this, we'll be equally ready like we were this time from the great financial crisis. So I'll have, thank you for the time to speak, to speak on this topic. Appreciate being here, and I'm going to hand it over to the next person. Thanks. Uh, Colin, um, what are your thoughts on where we go from here, and how much is COVID-19 factored into that in terms of market performance? Do you see you know, Brexit or the U.S. presidential elections or you know, demand from China? Do you see other factors becoming uh more relevant to how investors react uh in the markets versus what's happening with with covid itself i i think policymakers will do whatever it takes for however long it takes so uh, in the past typically you would have uh, policymakers preempting for instance an increase a feared increase in inflation this time around, they're going to ensure that we get out of this crisis and ensure that we see an, an, a rebound in economic activity by keeping policy loose, fiscal and monetary, for as long as is necessary. And they'll want to be absolutely certain and secure in the belief that this is behind us and the economies are all recovering on a safe or upward path before, before we begin to see some tightening. So you combine that really massive monetary stimulus and that massive fiscal stimulus globally with a reversal of the globalization trend that has been so, so important to the world economy in the past 30 years. And I believe we are setting the stage for an increase in inflation. It mightn't be in two years' time. It mightn't be in three years' time. But when we do see it come, I think central banks are going to be less preemptive than we might have expected in the past, less preemptive than the rule books suggests. And they're going to leave inflation run for a while before they begin to act. And I think that's going to be the biggest, biggest story of the next four or five years for investors. That's, that's really interesting. I've, I've heard you know, some of the central bank uh, governors here in the United States talk about that very issue about how they will be patient. They're not just going to react to, you know, the first quarter or, or two quarters even. They kind of want to see, you know, where where the inflation trajectory goes. So that, that will be fascinating. And um, I'd love to get your thoughts as well on just sort of where we go from here. And are there other things that you think will affect markets besides COVID just given uh, other events coming up? So, so I would completely agree that, that inflation um, will be an issue, whether it's two years, three years. I, I think in the middle part of this decade, we won't be dealing with hyperinflation, but we will be dealing with inflation and the potential for that inflation to be uh, coupled with stagnant economic growth. So return to the stagflation that we saw many, many years ago. Um, I'm in the, the, the near term, and that's the 12 to 18 month time horizon. I'm optimistic about economic growth in the markets because I think from a COVID perspective, we will be able to, um, to test, treat, and ultimately do a decent job of preventing COVID. I think that behaviors will change as a result of the pandemic and that there are certain things that won't come back in the same, in the same way. But I think ultimately the aggregate economy will, 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 be, will be okay. The bigger issues beyond COVID, as I see it, um, really is the, the accelerated movement of the world being really forming around a multipolar arrangement in which there are economic orbits, economic and political orbits around the U.S., economic and political orbits around, around China. I think that has profound implications for public policy and and investing and i think that is um you know that is a big deal i would say that related to that one of the things that we didn't talk about today but that i think should be on the viewers radar screen is i think there is the potential for escalating tension between china and taiwan and an inconclusive u.s election result may create an opening for China to take more aggressive action towards Taiwan if there is a, a vacuum in leadership. 
The other last point that I'd like to make is that technology, I would agree that some stocks, I can't explain their valuation, but technology is a, is a, is a big deal. And I'll just give you one, one number to think about in terms of the virtual world versus the real world, and that's FanDuel and DraftKings. Um, and I'm not an owner of either stock, but they have 14 million users, and that's up from zero less than a decade ago. In comparison, MGM Grand and Las Vegas Sands have, you know, a few thousand hotel rooms, and hotel rooms and visitors to Las Vegas have flatlined for the last decade. The economics in that virtual world are really different than the economics of the capital intensive world. And I think we're still processing the implications uh, of those differences in, in economics and the new technology fueled world. So thanks for that. Well, and talk about, you know, stock markets, the online retail investing, the Robin Hoods of the world, especially during the pandemic um, and how that's affected markets is also an interesting phenomenon. Um, we are all out of time now. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for joining us and to our distinguished panelists for this interesting discussion. And again, I hope all of you um, stay healthy and uh, best through the rest of the year when uh, there's some possibly tumultuous events <laughs> coming up that we all stay sane throughout it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gina. Nice meeting you guys. Pleasure to meet yes, you. Yes, thanks so much. Thank you, guys. This well done. Fun. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Look forward to seeing you in Lisbon next year. Yes, exactly. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.